for a supranational currency to work, really what we would have to achieve would be for national interests to be somehow resolved at a supranational level. And that's very hard to do. Just the very contradiction of a government that's claiming that it's broke and all of a sudden finds the money to spend close to a trillion PIs over taxes to fight the pandemic should have made it clear that they were lying before. What I have said is that this campaign is not just about electing a president, it is about making a political revolution. NFT. Taking money from our children and borrowing from China. People are dying. Is the program so critical it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if not, I'll get rid of it. Stop lying! Now, let's see if we can avoid the apocalypse altogether. Here's another episode of Macro and Cheese with your host, Steve Grumbine. All right, this is Steve with Macro and Cheese. Recently in Reuters and pretty much any publication out there, announced that Brazil and Argentina were sparking some excitement over the possibility of a potential currency union. Though the two countries are unlikely to ditch the real or peso anytime soon, we brought our friend Daniel Conceição. He's a Brazilian economist. He studied his economics at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and his postgraduate studies were at UMKC under Professor Randall Ray and Stephanie Kelton, etc. He also is a professor of macroeconomics and public finance at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So with that, welcome, Daniel. I'm glad to have you back, sir. Yes, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. The Reuters article said some interesting things. I'll just read a little bit of it. It sparked off chatter about a European Union-style zonal currency for South America, though officials have since played that down, and analysts say a full-on currency union is a distant prospect. Lula has since said that early talks are focused on developing a shared unit of value for bilateral trade to reduce the reliance on the U.S. dollar. Brazil's executive secretary of finance ministry, Gabriel Galapolo, told Reuters that the regional unit of account would come alongside expanded credit to support exports to Argentina through banks that operate in that country. He also went on to say that Brazil's government would offer guarantees to banks that help provide financing, while Argentina, a major grains exporter, would have to provide collateral via hard assets like grains, gas, or oil. So with that, what's going on with this? This sounds kind of interesting. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing is that it forces us to reflect about different monetary and financial arrangements for bilateral relationships to be fostered. I wouldn't put too much on this plan of monetary integration. I think at this point, there's nothing really that suggests that this is something that is really being discussed and planned for the near future. But just to think about ways of making it easier for the two countries to exchange goods and to engage financially is very useful, especially if it means that we're finally going to rely a little less on other people's currencies, like the dollar. That is a welcome discussion. Well, why don't we start with that? Currently, I know that the U.S. dollar has been used to great detriment in many ways by being able to control not just the flows, but control policy and overall the relationships between the countries. Can you describe the impact that being so closely tied to the dollar has had on Brazil and the rest of South America? 
Yeah, so if you think about the reliance on dollars and what it means, there is this one instance when you really have no escaping having to acquire dollars before you make a purchase, which is if you're buying something from the U.S. So that's one instance where you need dollars. The second instance is because the dollar is so widely accepted everywhere else in the world, it usually means that other countries also accept dollar payments. So you might also want to get dollars to buy from those countries. And in most cases, the dollar becomes an intermediary between different currencies. So in order for you to make a purchase, let's say to purchase something that is produced by Argentina, instead of exchanging reais for pesos, you would acquire dollars with your reais and then use those dollars to acquire pesos and make the payment in Argentina. Now, there is already a payment system in place that allows for direct currency swaps to occur so that you can already purchase pesos with reais. And this is the thing that I think should be strengthened. Whenever you can escape having to use dollars as an intermediary, to make a purchase in a foreign country, you should seek that opportunity because if anything, there's an administrative cost. You need to pay a premium to whoever is selling the dollar so that it makes sense for the dollar seller to sell it so that they buy the pesos. And again, you need to make that purchase interesting for the seller of the pesos. So if you can just exchange reais for pesos, you eliminate at least one party in the sequence, and you don't need to make it worth their while. So that reduces costs. But also, it means that if you can't acquire dollars, you can still make a purchase now because you have the reais to pay for the pesos. So that part of the arrangement, which already exists, that portion of the proposal is already in place. It needs to be strengthened because it's not as widely known and as widely utilized by those two economies, but that's in place. And that's the real key element of whatever innovation we want to seek to help those countries engage economically and financially. We talked to Fadl Kaboob and Ndongo Sambasila about trying to unify Africa to produce a collective, collaborative, symbiotic relationship there. And we've seen Europe try to do this as well. And the initial efforts at the Euro were incredibly bad. You had extreme differences between net importers and net exporters. And you saw the toll it took on countries like Greece, in particular, the southern portion of Europe. And there's some lessons that have been learned from building the EU. And they are slowly backing away from a European Union style arrangement. If you were to produce a currency union within these two countries or the larger continent, how would you do that? Or would that be an absolutely terrible move to make, giving up sovereignty and giving it over to that common currency? Yeah. So I think whenever I hear discussions about the currency union, it makes me worried exactly because the tendency for people is to copy the most horrible experiment with currency unions that you can imagine, which has been the euro. Now, the thing with the euro is that it was implemented based on a completely flawed understanding of money and fiscal finance. It basically was implemented by people who believed that austerity was needed for countries to engage economically responsibly within a continental arrangement. And the very existence of trading balances between those countries, because they were using the same currency, would no longer be reduced or eliminated via exchange rate variation. What you usually have is if a country is persistently net importing from another country, it needs to get the other country's currency. And in order to achieve that, you either borrow in that currency, and that usually comes with a limit, 
or your currency will depreciate relative to the other currency and then reduces the incentive of importing from that country because imports will become more expensive. So that creates a little bit of a regulating element. That's not the ideal mechanism, but it reduces potentially explosive moments, such as what happened in the Eurozone. Because what happened there, the trading balances were being accumulated as public debts because the private debts would be much more quickly and sustainable. So Greece was turning their net imports into basically growing public debts. And that could have been perfectly acceptable for both countries. Let's say that you have a very simplistic structure where basically you have Greece and Germany and no one else, so that we can think about it more simply. Well, if Germany is not exporting to Greece and Greece is not importing from Germany, basically they could be very satisfied because Germany has a greater productive capacity and is benefiting from the demand that comes from Greece in order to keep selling their goods and producing and generating income domestically. And Greece is purchasing more goods than it would if it could have met imports from Germany. So that could be perfectly accepted. The only reason why it wasn't sustainable is because the accumulating debt for Greece's government couldn't be validated by a currency issuer because the European Central Bank had no instruments of absorbing excess public debts from the Greek government. That became unsustainable because the private sector said, well, this debt might be getting too great and we don't want to buy that debt. And since the European Central Bank was also not a purchaser of Greek debt, that became unsustainable. Now, there was a very simple solution for all of that mess, which would be for the European Central Bank to create mechanisms to absorb excess debt from treasuries, from uh, federal governments, as long as that was compatible with a healthy continental economic system. And this is actually what federations do. So every national economy that has many regional economies put together, like states, like the U.S., for instance, has imbalances between states that get offset by the actions of the federal government. They basically inject income and then create net wealth for states that are net importers from other states. And that creates way more sustainable situations. So the problem with the European Union and the Eurozone wasn't so much that it cannot work, but it's that if you're going to combine monetary sovereignties from many countries into a supranational monetary sovereignty arrangement, you need to have offsetting mechanisms at the continental level, which didn't exist in Europe. So that just created that huge mess. And my concern is that we copy that very flawed system. That's a recipe for disaster. It would be for Brazil. Why don't we take a step back? Sure. Because one of the things I think that is often misunderstood as we try to forklift models from region A to region B are the impacts of the society and the norms of South American countries in particular. And so while we look at Europe and we understand much of history and much of the traditions of money came out of a Eurocentric view of money, it seems like in South America, a lot of the predation that has occurred from the global north on the global south has been trying to infuse these models within the South American countries. You see neoliberalism as a whole wiping out cultures and ways of life and looking for homogeneity, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. What makes South America different? What makes Brazil and Argentina different? What problems would we be solving? in the South American countries by doing this 
that maybe are a little different than the European one? Sure. So if we had all of the opportunities to really challenge economic orthodoxy and come up with a functional supranational monetary arrangement, the reason for doing that really would have to be to reduce our reliance on foreign currencies, especially the dollar and other developed country currencies. That's something that really, really plagued South American economies in the past. And the reason for that stems from a technological reliance. So we are heavily dependent on importing capital goods and technology from more developed economies in order to keep growing. So that means that our economic growth becomes dependent on acquiring other people's currencies, which is hard because if you're not exporting enough to get that currency, it means you need to borrow in that currency. But when you borrow someone else's currency in their currency, it means that you now become committed to getting more of that currency in the future to make that payments. And if you can't get the currency, you really are screwed because if you're heavily indebted in dollars, say in the case of Argentina, that's very clear. They're heavily indebted in dollars. And so they need to keep getting dollars no matter what, because they need to make their payments. And whenever there's not enough dollars for them to make their payments, it means that the price of dollars explodes. And when the price of dollars explodes, the price of everything else that they import by paying in dollars becomes that much more expensive. And that produces a huge inflationary shock that is oftentimes politically unsustainable. Because if you have a large inflationary shock, and if that shock is large enough for income receivers, especially wage earners, workers, to have their purchasing power hugely depleted, they'll get pissed. <laughs> and they usually become very angry with their government. And the government usually either loses an election or even gets deposed. So that's usually the economic and then the political cycles go together. And so this is actually why most South American governments are so worried about high inflation, because usually that means that their adversaries will gain power and that can also mean very bad things for them. So it's tricky that way. If you don't get the dollars, you could find yourself in hot water. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, is famous for coming to these global South countries and saying, we're here to help. Strip your country of all your public works, all your protections for local development and protections for local exports, and free market reigns supreme. And we'll give you access to U.S. dollars and we'll give you loans payable in whatever so that you can reinvigorate your economy, make yourself more business friendly. And they sell it like it's a great thing, but they are creating neo-colonial debt slaves. Is this what the supranational currency would be aiming to prevent that kind of scenario from occurring? Or does it have other practical uses? So I would only advise for Brazil and other South American countries to work towards a supranational currency if they actually intend to achieve that. And in order for them to do that, they need to abandon the austerity myths that currently have contaminated pretty much everyone in our governments, even leftist governments. Right now, I wouldn't trust anyone to come up with a functional supranational monetary arrangement. But if we were in charge, the two of us, I think that could be a way of trying to end. I love how you called it, this neo-colonial 
monitor slavery because that's what it is. Or you could even use the analogy of getting someone hooked into a terrible drug. Mm. You allow them to have a taste for the drug that in this case allows you to get quick access to technologies that you don't have, which can allow you to grow faster because you could increase your productive capacities by importing so many of those capital goods that you can currently produce. But once it comes the moment of paying for those loans, you have to deliver pretty much everything you have to keep making payments. So that's how they get you. And the funny thing is the dream of any monetary sovereign is to get their money accepted abroad as widely as possible. This is the dream. Now, the U.S. has achieved close to the perfect dream, which is to have everyone in the world accept the dollar. Now, what that allows you guys to do is basically get anything in the world that you want to make yourselves comfortable and to have your economies grow. And the way to achieve that goal of having everyone accept your currency could be to get them hooked into your currency. So in that sense, even something as seemingly generous and philanthropic as the Marshall Plan. And let's say, well, this has been something that was basically given funds for Europe to reconstruct itself after World War II. We're just giving you the dollar. Well, even something as seemingly positive and generous as that creates a demand for dollars for the future because everything that those countries are purchasing has to be replaced and kept by buying more things that are sold in dollars. So even something like that creates demand for dollars in the future. Now, it's even more effective if you lend the dollars so that you have to get dollars in the future to make payments. Now, that really makes you a slave of someone else's currency. So it's been a project. It's something that maybe a few of those things have been unintended consequences, but there might be a wider plan, a grander plan for the dollar to become so widely accepted, become the hegemonic currency in the world. And this means that it possibly has made a lot of people worry, especially if this has been a grand plan. Now, if I was the one responsible for that grand plan, I would be very worried today as the dollar has been somewhat challenged by many different currencies as an international reserve currency. Central banks are keeping a lot less dollars now than they used to as reserves. There's way more bilateral swap arrangements like the one between Brazil and Argentina, like the ones that Russia is establishing with China and other countries since the war in Ukraine started. So many things are happening that challenge the position of the dollar as the main currency in the world. And that could be worrisome for whoever understands how powerful that is. Let's take a look at that because normally we hand wave at people and I'm guilty of this because the petrodollar concept, which prices petroleum purchases in U.S. dollars, creates additional hegemony of the U.S. dollar. Based on Warren Mosler's statement that it's really not a big deal because in the end, the petrodollar is a numeraire. It's really more important what the country is saving. But if what they need to save in is U.S. dollars to be able to make these purchases, that by extension gives more ubiquity and adds to hegemony. As an MMT person in Brazil, what are your thoughts on the impacts to South America based on this concept of the petrodollar that came shortly after Bretton Woods? I would actually tend to agree with you very strongly on that. I think it's hugely important. And this might be an instance when our attachment to the fundamentals of the theory might be too great. Because when we claim 
that taxes are the main driver of currency acceptability. What we really mean is that necessity is the main driver. And since taxes make you need the currency to make tax payments in order to avoid being punished, then you give acceptability to that currency that is used to make tax payments. Now, in the very exact same way, if there's a commodity that is hugely needed for your economy to function, everyone needs to purchase that. And if that commodity is only purchasable in a particular currency, that also necessarily will give acceptability to that currency. And there's actually a very good paper that has been written by a colleague of mine, Caio Valela, and then with another economist that I can't quite recall her name, and it's a shame, because I'm friends with Caio, but she should also get full credit for this. And they actually wrote a piece showing that the moment when the dollar became the currency used for denominating contracts in oil was hugely important for consolidating the hegemonic position of the dollar. I tend to think that this is very important, but also if we understand this, it allows us to identify those things that make you rely less on the dollar. Because if your goal is to rely as little as possible on other countries' currencies, what you really should do is to boost your capacity to supply those things that are most important for your economy domestically. And if you're a country like Brazil that has huge oil reserves, that has tremendous capacity for producing food, that has water self-sufficiency, energy production is very easy to do in Brazil. So all those things should be used to reduce your dependency on the dollar. And it's something that I think MMT helps us understand. Actually, I think Fidel Kabul is someone who's been stressing that very well. Absolutely. I frequently have downplayed the role of the petrodollar simply because in the end, if the petrodollar vanished, it would not change the fact that the United States government could purchase anything for sale in U.S. dollars. Japan doesn't have a petro yen. There's not a petro pound sterling. So these countries seem to be able to handle their business. We have a very different thing. 900 military bases around the world and a whole host of other aspects of it that allows us really by economic terror, control countries, destroy their sovereignty with sanctions and being tied to the dollar system, which is a very undemocratic currency to begin with. What are your thoughts there? Well, I think you said something that is hugely important here, and it helps us really understand what's at stake. So. Any government can purchase anything that is for sale in the currency that they create. So that's true for any country. The problem is how large is that space of things that are for sale in the currency that your government creates. And the tools for increasing that space, for increasing the vastness, the size of the supply of things that you can purchase with your currency. Those tools are as wide as political and military and all of those arrangements that we were describing, such as the fact that oil contracts are denominated in dollars. So every government that creates the currency that is used in their country is equally sovereign in that sense. So the Brazilian government is equally monetarily sovereign as the U.S. government because they can both create the money that purchases anything that is for sale in their currency. The problem is the U.S. has come up with a whole bunch of ways of increasing the size of the space where dollars are accepted in exchange for goods that goes way beyond their territory. 
And I think that's what we need to understand is how do you get your currency to be accepted outside your borders? And how can you come up with a global system that makes these arrangements fair? Because in many ways, it's really not fair that the U.S. can purchase so much more in the entire world just because their currency is so widely accepted. But that's the way of the world right now. It might be actually a good thing that the U.S. hasn't really made use of that power to its full extent because it keeps thinking that it doesn't have the dollars to buy things. <laughs> and then it says, you guys are self-sabotaging your capacity to acquire a lot more stuff from the world because you are also contaminated by austerity beliefs. You are listening to Macro and Cheese, a podcast brought to you by Real Progressives, a nonprofit organization dedicated to teaching the masses about MMT or modern monetary theory. Please help our efforts and become a monthly donor at PayPal or Patreon. Like and follow our pages on Facebook and YouTube. And follow us on Periscope, Twitter, Twitch, Rockfin, and Instagram. We don't look at it that way. My tagline on Twitter is austerity is murder. And people in the U.S. don't even understand what that word means. The rest of the world does, but the U.S. is still trying to figure it out. Let me go back to South America. Years and years ago, before I fully got on the MMT train, I had read Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Oh, yeah. And I've heard different things where they say this has been debunked. But the further I get in this MMT, the more I see from the IMF and look at the structural adjustments imposed, even digging into Thomas Sankara in Africa, you realize that maybe it wasn't a fiction. Maybe he dramatized some things or maybe he added a little flavor so that it read better. But regardless of whether his exact story is true or not, it seems to match up with everything that I've seen from people that look more at a geopolitical MMT frame than, say, maybe folks that focus largely on the domestic side. What are your thoughts on that? I think that if it's not exactly as he described, something like that has to occur. And we can talk about Shanks kicking away the ladder as a description of the same type of economic assassination. The fact of the matter is mainstream economics is a tool to preserve both domestically the interests of the ruling class, but also internationally. It allows for stronger countries and more developed countries to keep their claws or less developed ones and to retain access to their resources. So I think Maybe the mistake in the analysis has been that we tend to think of this economic hitman as if they're working to secure the interests of the entire country. So let's imagine those people go to South America to make sure that American interests are being secured. That's not what happens at all. I think what's happening is they're securing the interests of a very select group of people that are also working against their interests of the majority of the American people. So it's not as if you have countries against countries. I think you have the elites of particular countries buying the influence of economic commentators and the lobbyists that go abroad and convince governments of those countries to embrace self-sabotaging policies 
because those policies make sure that whoever has the money to buy those services are being favored by the results. Because that allows us even to understand that maybe the interests of the majority in both countries, both developed and developing countries, are more aligned than it makes it seem by those uh, descriptions. As if it's the entire United States of America using economic hit people to make sure that South America submits to American interests. I think it's just the elites in the U.S. that are using their power to keep both the U.S. economy from producing results that would be more satisfying for the entire population, but also make sure that they can exploit less developed countries in a way that is profitable to them. Within the context of a complementary currency, not necessarily the currency union, but even the downgraded one that Lula backed into in recent reports, what do you see in terms of, we've had Scott Ferguson and Ben Wilson of the Modern Money Network come on and discuss the concept of the uni, which was a university-based complementary currency. Is it similar to that or something totally different? Well, those classroom currencies and university currencies, they're useful analogies for us to imagine any monetary arrangement. I actually use a similar exercise both to teach my students how money gets accepted by having a tax that is payable in the money that I issue. If they don't pay the tax, they lose a part of their grades. And that's the buckaroo experiment that Warren Mosler devised for UMKC. And I have adapted it to my students, but also I've been trying to use it to explore open economy issues by having different classrooms use different currencies and have them purchase from one another, having to engage in exchange rate issues and all of that. But for a supranational currency to work, really what we would have to achieve would be for national interests to be somehow resolved at a supranational level. And that's very hard to do. In many instances, countries, especially given the current state of economic debate, would tend to seek to become net exporters. And you can't have everyone be a net exporter within the currency union. And there would be punishments for net importers that are accumulating debt in the supranational currency. So that's something that you need to resolve. You would have to negotiate the size of imbalances that are acceptable for all parties. And maybe that's doable, maybe that's not. But an analogy that works, I think it's a good analogy because it helped me understand the euro situation, is a poker analogy with the bank being played by either an MMT-informed house or an austerity. So let's suppose we're playing poker, the two of us, and you're a terrible player and much better than you. So I keep winning. Now, if I keep winning, eventually you run out of chips. Now, possibly we could end the game, but if the whole purpose of us playing poker was to keep playing poker because that made us satisfied because, say, that kept in a real economy, that would mean that we would keep producing goods and selling to each other, there would be no use to stop in the game. And if we were perfectly satisfied with me winning and you losing for a while, the perfect solution would be for the house to say, well, I'll give you the chips so that you keep losing to me. And if that's satisfying for both parties, then let's just keep giving the chips so that Steve can keep losing to Daniel. <laughs> or another situation would be, well, for Daniel to land Steve the chips. So basically, you would be paying me in a different currency, which would be your debt denominated in the first currency. That's fine too. But the problem is the tendency, given that everyone thinks 
about these issues as if money was the scarce resource, I wouldn't be willing to keep lending you the chips because I would realize that you're a terrible player. Right. We're not realizing that my winning was the reason for you losing. So the one thing that can't happen, which is what happened in Europe, is for the winning player to complain that the losing player is losing too much, which is exactly what Germany was doing. Germany was saying, well, Greece, you better stop losing because you're a terrible player. <laughs> but Greece should have said, well, I could stop losing if you stop winning. Do you want to stop waiting? And so any arrangement that works would have to uh, establish an arrangement in which both the winnings, the trade surpluses, and the losses, the net equals, would be equally satisfying to all parties. And the way that you validate those is to allow that whatever financial stock is being created by those imbalances which could be public debts. I think it's the best way to do it is just to allow public debts to be at the level that makes those imbalances possible. And in order for that to happen, all it takes is for the currency issuer, in this case, the supranational central bank, to purchase the excess public debts that are being issued. Now, if that's achievable, then it could work. But if that's something that we can't imagine happening, then I think the best possible scenario is for currency swaps to be established in which the participating central banks basically say, well, I'm willing to acquire a given quantity of the other party's currency so that it allows for trade deficits to be financed in a way. So. Basically, you would have the adjustments occur at the level of reserves being accumulated by the net exporting central bank, and the size of those increases in reserves could be adjusted to the level that the central bank of the net exporting country deems acceptable, because that's easier to do. All it would take is for the government to say, well, we're glad that we're exporting to Argentina, and we're willing to accumulate pesos. So the central bank just accumulates the quantity of pesos necessary for those exports to take in place. And I think that's the more realistically functional arrangement. Anything that creates a supranational currency would have to have such a fair supranational authority acting on behalf of every participant but I think it would make it too hard. From an international perspective or beyond your country's borders perspective, the swap lines make sense at the central bank. But what about internally? I envision concentric circuits. And at some point, the local currency would need to transition somehow back to the other currency, whatever the national currency is. How do you control that relationship can you explain how that internal swap occurs? Yeah, so from the point of view of the importing party, let's say you are an importer of Brazilian goods, you're an Argentinian importer. What you need to do is to buy reais from someone. And in order for a trading balance to occur, those reais would have to come from more than just the imports that Brazil is buying. Let's get back again. So we're saying that you are trying to buy reais and you're offering pesos. Now, one way of Argentina acquiring those reais would be for Brazil to import from Argentina that very value. So the same value of reais that is being sought by you is being given to Argentinian players that are selling to Brazilians. So you have a perfect trade balance between the two countries. Now, in that sense, those reais that you're trying to buy will be available for you because there's other people who are equally trying to buy pesos in exchange for reais. So in that sense, all you need is for a functional exchange for a currency market to operate. You'll have intermediary banks 
doing the heavy lifting with the support of the central banks, but basically you're using the currency that is being offered in exchange for the other currency just for a trade to occur. Now, if Argentina doesn't get enough reais from its sales to Brazil, it could also try to sell financial assets, debts, to Brazilians. And if Brazilians are willing to buy those debts, then you'll get a trading balance that will be compensated by a financial capital account imbalance of the same size. So your net imports will be compensated by your net exports of debts and properties. Now, the problem with that is if you're borrowing and your debt is denominated in the foreign currency, your obligations in the future will require that you get more reais in the future. And maybe those reais are not as easily available as now. So in the future, when you're trying to make that payments, the price of reais will be too high and that will mean an inflationary shock that you might not find accepted. So that's the arrangement without central banks intervening. Now, how could we help those imbalances to keep taking place by using both monetarily sovereign central banks? If both Brazil and Argentina feel like it's desirable for those net imports from Argentina to keep happening because Brazil is happy being a net exporter, then all it would take is for the Brazilian central bank to purchase the excess pesos that are being offered within the foreign currency markets and just offer the necessary reais in order for the exchange rate not to deviate from whatever level it finds desirable. Now, it could be either a fixed exchange rate or a dirty floating exchange rate. But the key here is for the central bank to provide, to supply enough reais so that the peso doesn't devalue when you're trying to keep that net import going into the future. And that's very easy for both central banks to achieve. All it takes, actually, is for the net exporting country's central bank to be willing to do it in order for that to take place. That's actually what explains the U.S. imbalance against China. For a very long time, the only thing that was happening in order for that imbalance to keep taking place was for the Chinese central bank to be willing to accumulate dollar reserves. And that forces the net imbalance to keep occurring. So any central bank is capable of validating the net imports of a foreign country using its own currency. Now, this is an arrangement that involves both Brazil and Argentina. It would mean that Brazil's government, Brazil's central bank, would have to be willing to allow that imbalance to take place. Now, if you want to have that take place within a continental space involving many countries and for many imbalances to be validated by many central banks, that's when you might want to introduce a supranational currency. And you might also want to have a supranational monetary authority doing that work. Because now each net importing country would have to get the supranational currency, and as long as the supranational central bank was willing to offer that currency, you could still make that work almost in the exact same way. The problem is everyone would have to be happy with those imbalances. Gotcha. I guess my final question to you, and this seems like a strange dialectical position, I guess, in the U.S., we are the hegemon, and people here are just used to hearing we don't have the money. Yeah. But in South American countries, do you think regular people that are in the global South, would you say they're more aware of these kind of arrangements? Because it seems like the people in the U.S. have absolutely no clue except for the elite. This seems like the kind of thing that everybody would need to know just simply because you have to wonder how and why the kinds of inflation and tragic economic conditions that come through U.S. manipulation 
through their own geopolitical strategies, leveraging the dollar, you have to wonder that they would be hyper aware of this. What are regular people thinking about when they hear this stuff down there in Brazil, for example? Well, it's actually not good. It's as bad as and possibly worse than what you get there. And that's something that I struggle to understand exactly what's the difficulty in understanding that money is just another public debt that should be created functionally in order to achieve the most out of our monetary economies. What's the problem here? I think partly it has to do with economic hitmen that we were trying to identify. Because in reality, when we're talking about what we describe the economic hitmen, really we're describing professional liars that are paying substantial amounts to advocate against the policies that would make it so that governments eliminate poverty, eliminate unemployment, and put their economies in a sustainable growth path. And why do these people sabotage our governments like that? Well, they make a lot of money doing that. So who benefits from lying so much? And the lie, if anything, the pandemic should have taught us that there's no financial limit to government spending. And during the pandemic, all governments just pretty much abandoned any fiscal rule, any fiscal limit, any fiscal target that was described as necessary for the economy to function and pretty much spent as much as they needed so that their economy survived the pandemic shock. In Brazil, we came close to a trillion reais in primary deficit spending during 2020. And that was by a government that had openly argued that it was broke right before the pandemic. Now, just the very contradiction of a government that's claiming that it's broke and all of a sudden finds the money to spend close to a trillion AIs over taxes to fight the pandemic should have made it clear that they were lying before. So it's not ignorance. It's not lack of understanding. It's dishonest. And we need to point that out. Who is making money from all the dishonesty? And basically, we know the answer, right? Anyone who earns higher than needed interest rates will argue for higher than needed interest rates. So if the way of achieving those higher than necessary interest rates is to claim that the government is broke, that's what they're going to do. Anyone who gains from forcing governments to privatize every public service because, again, they're saying that the government can't pay for those things, will argue for the privatization of those things. And within the international system, anyone who can make sure that they'll have access to cheaper resources from developing countries, and they'll have access to those markets in a much easier way, will argue for the governments of developing countries not to embrace a more interventionist approach to their economy. So we need to figure out who gains from all the line, and we need to be brave enough to denounce it too. I think this is something that a lot of people are doing. And just to finish here, unfortunately, even our leftist leaders here in Brazil haven't really realized this. And I'm not sure if they really believe it. Maybe they do because they've learned mainstream economics a little too hard, but they still buy into this whole idea that government spending and government debts are a bad thing because they're exhausting the resources of the government that could be used for other things. So you have things like people arguing against public debts as if that's something that takes away from more useful spending. 
and those are leftist leaning people. You have people arguing that in order for us to increase spending, we need to have a tax reform that increases tax revenues. And even if that's aimed at taxing the rich more, just the conditionality is stupid. You shouldn't make it a conditionality for you to tax more in order to spend. Now, I'm all for taxing the rich, but that shouldn't be a condition for you to spend if there is excess capacity in the economy. So all those things are very frustrating, I'd say. One of the frustrating things for me in the United States is there's a proclivity to call truly awful people, people that are doing horrible things, my good friend. And it happens ridiculously so in the United States. And for me, I have a real problem with that because I know the people that are not living that life, that are suffering mightily, that are worried about their existence. And there's a lot of anger and rage in just the U.S. at these elites that maybe know the truth, but placate rich and powerful people as opposed to speaking on behalf of those suffering the most. It seems like that's not unique to the United States. It seems like that, dare I say, cowardice is global. What is important to take away from this potential currency union? Well, I think that just the exercise of imagining functional monetary arrangements that go beyond single currencies for single national economies, I think that's useful. In a lot of ways, we took the terrible, terrible experiment of the euro as if it means that something like this is impossible. And I think functionally, it's still possible to imagine something that works, that brings together many monetary sovereignties. Because basically what we would be doing is not so much eliminating monetary sovereignties, but bringing monetary sovereigns together in a cooperative arrangement that tends to be useful for all of them. And I think we've touched on a few ideas that could be useful that can be taken from MMT, from a functional reasoning about economics. So that, in a sense, I think is a positive thing. Now, I wouldn't trust the current leaders, even as progressively leaning as they are in Brazil, to come up with something that doesn't replicate a lot of the austerity limitations that are imposed on national governments if we had a supranational arrangement. I think, if anything, it would increase the limitations. So I wouldn't touch it for that reason alone. Now, I think something you said is super important. It has to do with the way we treat professional liars. I think we need to be braver than we are. I think if there's one huge mistake that can be identified with Lula's presidency over this month or so is its unwillingness to challenge the current economic orthodox. Lula has done that. It needs to be pointed out that his speeches are very aggressively anti-mainstream. The problem is that once he says something, the financial markets get their professional liars mobilized, and they all go on rants, either on TV stations or they write pieces. And people in the government get very scared of that. They're terrified of being accused of being fiscally responsible. (laughs) They're terrified of being accused of not being serious economists. And I think what we should do is to make sure that people understand that people who work in finance are not better economists than us. In fact, they have every reason to lie and to be worse at macroeconomic analysis and policymaking than we are because their vested interests are opposed to what works for the majority of the people. They're interested in keeping earnings for banks and financial institutions as high as possible. And that means that the opportunity cost of producing 
of investing productively will be higher. So they're not there to help us achieve a functioning economy. They're there to sabotage us. And if we're listening to those people, we're making a huge mistake, which we are. Could not agree more. And with that, Daniel, you are a breath of fresh air, my friend. I really appreciate the candor. I appreciate you didn't smooth talk those things into downplaying them. Those are very serious issues. And it fills my heart with joy and sadness, both here that there are people that are willing to say the truth and also sad that the truth is so bleak. And I want to thank you once again for joining me. This is Steve Grumbine with Macro and Cheese. Please check out the rest of our episodes. We've got over 200 episodes. You can go back, you can listen to them. There's transcripts, there's extras, there's hours of work going into the back end of these podcasts. So by all means, support the organization. If you can become a donor, we appreciate it. Help us get the word out to even more people. And with that, Daniel, one more time, thank you so much for joining me today on Macro and Cheese. Folks, we are out of here. Macro and Cheese is produced by Andy Kennedy. Descriptive writing by Virginia Cox and promotional artwork by Andy Kennedy. Macro and Cheese is publicly funded by our Real Progressive Patreon account. If you would like to donate to Macro and Cheese, please visit patreon.com slash real progressive. I want the truth!